Hello everyone. So our next EKG module is going to be uh, focusing on intraventricular conduction abnormalities. Uh, it is titled Bundles and Branches and Blocks, oh my. So let's begin. So what are intraventricular conduction abnormalities? Um, basically this is a delay in the phase of the conduction sequence and this causes a lengthening and distortion of the corresponding portion of the EKG waveform. Therefore in any intraventricular conduction abnormality you will have a widening and distortion of the QRS complex. So when we're talking about our intraventricular conduction abnormalities, the big ones that we always think of are our left bundle branch block and our right bundle branch block, and these are the widest of the blocks. Um, fascicular blocks, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, do not significantly prolong the cure restoration, but these really are important to kind of recognize because they can mimic a previous infarction. Um, and because only the left bundle branch splits into two fascicles, there's only two fascicular blocks, and these are the more common left anterior and the relatively rare left posterior. So what are some typical causes of uh, intraventricular conduction abnormalities? Um, there's a whole bunch of them, but just kind of going over the more common ones here. Um, any kind of atherosclerotic heart disease, um, any infiltrative cardiomyopathy such as sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, uh, fibrotic heart disease, um, some of the more congenital ones. Uh, electrolyte abnormalities can cause this, such as hyperkalemia. Uh, any kind of infectious disease such as Lyme disease, Chagas disease, anything that's going to affect the myocardium, the conduction system, um, connective tissue diseases such as scleroderma, um, toxicologic such as uh, TCA poisoning, um, PEs can cause this as well as uh, congenital heart disease, um, and then even things like uh, iatrogenic, so right heart catheterization um, can cause these blocks, and then there are normal variants of this as well. So just going over the bundle branch blocks here, um, basically, you should consider this whenever you see a QRS complex that's greater than 0.12 seconds. Uh, so just to kind of talk about the normal QRS complex, um, where you really want to look here is you want to look in your precordial lead, so V1 through V6. Um, typically, what happens is you have depolarization of the septum, and this occurs from a left to right direction. Therefore, in V1, which is your right precordial lead, you should see a small R wave um, initially, and then this is going to be followed by a large S wave, which is going to be your left ventricular depolarization, which progresses from a right to left direction. If you look in V6, which is going to be more of your left precordial lead, you're going to see the opposite from V1. So you're going to see initial Q wave depression, and this is going to be followed by a large R wave. And here is a visual representation of the bundle of Hiss with the uh, left and right bundles. Uh, here. So this is just a really good image to kind of get stuck in your head. A uh, good picture to always refer to when you're kind of thinking about, um, you know, how the left and right bundle branches, um, you know, function. Um, and a lot of this, if you're able to kind of visualize this picture, you can pretty much come up with the EKG findings uh, on your own. Uh, so just always keep this picture in mind when we're talking about right and bundle branch blocks here, okay? So talk about right bundle branch block first. Um, just to kind of discuss uh, what happens at the right bundle branch. So typically the first thing you're going to notice is the septum is going to depolarize normally from the left to the right. However, this is going to have a prolonged duration. Um, next, what's going to happen is you're going to have the left ventricular depolarization, which will proceed normally. However, the resultant wave will be diminished because of the prolonged septal depolarization in the opposite direction. This is going to be followed by delayed right ventricle um, which then depolarizes unopposed. Uh, so just to kind of go over the morphology, um, you know, of how we would identify this in an EKG um, and why the morphology is such. So if we're looking in V1 um, and V6, initially you're going to see a small R wave in V1, and initially you're going to see a small Q wave in V6, and these are going to be from the septal depolarization, okay? Next, what's going to happen is you're going to have a subsequent X, S wave that's going to be um, small or even absent in V1, and you're going to have a very large R wave, uh, basically in lead V6, and this is going to be secondary to the depolarization of the large left ventricle, as we can see here. And then finally, we're going to have a terminal R prime wave in V1, and a wide S wave from the delayed right ventricle depolarization in V6. And if you look at these two very closely, you can see that it's almost a mirror reflection of each other. Uh, so deflections in V1 are opposite of that in V6, and so on. So you get that significant bunny ear kind of pattern in V1, whereas you have 
a reverse bunny ear pattern in Leeds V6. So here is uh, you know, an EKG of a uh, typical right bundle branch block. And you can see in Leeds V1, V2, you're going to have that typical R, um, S, R prime pattern um, you know, in V1, V2. And then if you look at uh, you know, V6, you're going to have um, the Q wave uh, from the septal depolarization with that large, um, tall R wave and then that widened uh, S wave at the end, significant for the right ventricular depolarization. So here's just the, uh, you know, some EKG criteria for right bundle branch block. Uh, this is pretty much, uh, you know, this is a little more complex than we probably need to know for the ER. Um, but, uh, you know, big things that we want to look for, obviously, you know, the QRS wave needs to be greater than 0.12 seconds. Um, when you're looking at leads V1, V2, you want to see that rabbit ear um, or M-shaped QRS complex. And then, um, you know, you want to see a nice, deep, wide S wave in the uh, left precordial lead, so your V5, V6. Once again, this is what we're describing here. So what about ST segment and T wave changes when we're looking at run, right bundle branch blocks? And how are we supposed to know if these are normal, if these are concerning for STEMI and MI? Um, so basically, ST segment and T wave changes can be seen in right bundle blant, uh, branch blocks, and these uh, are normal for the most part. Um, they typically occur in the right precordial leads with primarily positive QRS complexes, so looking at V1 through V3. Um, and these leads, repolarization changes, result in ST segments and T waves that are opposite to or discordant with the overall direction of the QRS wave. Therefore, any elevation in these leads is highly suggestive of acute myocardial injury. ST segments and other leads are typically unaffected by the right bundle branch block, and any deviation should be assessed as usual. So consider any other you know, ST segment abnormalities, elevations, to be considered abnormal in leads other than V1 through V3 in a right bundle branch block. And these are kind of the leads you really want to focus on that might have some abnormal ST segment changes, which can be normal. But as you can see, um, you know, they're discordant with the uh, QRS complex. So the ST segment is opposite of that of the um, QRS complex. And if there is a concordance there, you want to consider um, ischemia. So moving on to left bundle branch blocks. Uh, so, you know, in left bundle bra branch blocks, basically what's going to happen is your septal depolarization is going to be delayed and actually proceed abnormally from right to left. So as we kind of discussed before, or, um, earlier, you know, typically this goes from left to right in a left bundle branch block. However, the septum is going to depolarize from right to left. So if you look in V1, you're actually going to see a small R wave as opposed to a, um, you know, small Q wave, which you would typically see um, with no normal depolarization of the septum. Um, next, what's going to happen is you're going to have a ventricular wall depolarization, which is going to proceed mostly normally from right to left direction. So while the right ventricle is going to depolarize, you know, the left ventricle is still much, much larger. So by having a prolonged depolarization in that direction, you're going to develop this typically monophasic large, um, you know, S wave or a, you know, in V1 or a very large monophasic um, R wave in V6. Um, and typically, if you look at, um, you know, V6, you might even see a little bit of a notch in there. And that's because you have the right ventricle, which is almost suppressing the depolarization of the left ventricle. But once that left ventricle is then depolarizing on its own, you might see a little bit of a spike there. And that's where the notch kind of take place, takes place. And here, once again, just looking at, uh, you know, the EKG here, as you can see in V1, we have that small um, R wave, uh, which is uh, basically that abnormal septal depolarization followed by that very large, wide, um, you know, deep S wave. And this could also just be seen as a, a one lo single large Q wave. Um, and then looking in V6, um, you see we have that uh, large monophasic R wave um, with a little bit of a notch at the end, which is basically consistent with that really prolonged, uh, you know, left ventricular depolarization. So once again, here's some criteria for the left bundle branch block. Uh, obviously, once again, you want to have a QRS complex longer than 0.12 seconds. Um, and then you're going to have this uh, monophasic slurred or notched R wave and leads V5, V6, um, and then that really large, uh, you know, QS or RS pattern in uh, V1, V2. Just to show it again right there. So what about ST segment and T wave changes um, with your left bundle branch blocks? Um, so once again, you know, ST segment deviation should be opposite to or discordant with the predominant direction of the QRS wave. So if your QRS wave is a negative deflection, you know, your ST segment, your T wave should be positive. 
Uh, so in leads with predominantly positive QRS waves, like I said, the ST segments um, and T waves are going to be isoelectric or depressed, but in leads where they're predominantly negative QRS, the ST segments are either isoelectric or elevated. Deviations in this pattern can um, you know, describe acute myocardial ischemia. And as you can see here, you know, if there's a uh, positive or negative QRS complex, you should have a opposite, um, you know, T wave or ST segment. So one set of criteria we can actually use to help us uh, identify individuals um, who may be having an MI who also have a, uh, you know, pre-existing left bundle branch block um, is something called the Scarbosa criteria. Um, and basically this is a set of uh, three criteria which we can use to really help us identify if someone may be having a significant uh, ischemic event, uh, you know, in the ER. Um, so the first criteria is basically anyone who has any concordant ST segment elevation greater than one millimeter and leads with a positive QRS complex um, is going to be concerning uh, for acute myocardial uh, event. So like I said, the QRS wave and the T wave, they should always be discordant or opposite. If you have um, them, you know, any ST segment elevation in the same direction as the QRS complex, um, so this, that's, this is going to be concerning for an acute myocardial infarction. Um, also, if you have any concordant ST segment depression, which is greater than one millimeter, and leads V1 through V3, this can also be concerning for ischemia. Finally, any excessively discordant ST segment elevation, so greater than one millimeter, uh, and leads with a negative QRS complex, um, can be concerning. So, if you have, for example, um, you know, like I said, uh, your QRS and T wave or ST segment should always be discordant. But if they're discordant and there's an elevation greater than five millimeters in that lead, this is extremely concerning for ischemia and the person should be treated as uh, a STEMI and uh, brought to the cath lab. So next we're just gonna do a quick review on fascicular blocks. Um, so fascicular blocks, you know, they're not necessarily too important for us in the ER, but they can help us, uh, you know, if we understand them and if we see them, um, it can help us avoid making mistakes of identifying an EKG abnormality as maybe a previous infarct if we know that this person has a uh, fascicular block. Um, so just talking a little bit about anatomy. So once again, your left bundle branch splits into two branches. You have your left anterior fascicle, uh, which supplies the anterior superior papillary muscle, and you have your left posterior fascicle, which supplies the posterior inferior papillary muscle. So the left anterior fascicular block is going to be the more common of the two fascicular blocks. Um, and basically what's going to happen here is, as you can see in the picture, um, by having a block in the left anterior fascicle, the depolarization is going to progress from a, uh, basically from an inferior posterior region um, up. So what is this going to look like? This is going to result in depolarization in an anterolateral direction. On an EKG, this is going to be shown in the inferior leads. This is going to demonstrate an initial upward deflection followed by a larger downward deflection. This shifts the overall QRS axis leftward. Okay? Um, and I'll show you a picture of this in one second here. Um, so left QRS axis deviation, this is going to be criteria for left anterior fascicular block. You're also going to have a slightly widened QRS complex, but this is not going to be larger than 1, 0.12 seconds unless there is a right bundle branch block associated with it. Um, and, uh, you know, here's the criteria for that here, but I can show you basically in the next picture what you're going to see. So as you can see in your, uh, basically in your inferior leads, you're going to have a small, uh, you know, R wave followed by a nice deep, uh, S wave there in leads two, three and AVF. So in your inferior leads, and then if you're looking at your lateral leads, you're going to see in leads one and AVL, a small uh, S wave or Q wave followed by a large R wave. And here's just another representation of that here, um, you know, showing the uh, inferior leads as well as the lateral leads and the corresponding um, morphologies. Um, also, you're going to have a prolonged R wave peak time. Uh, so the time of, from onset of the QRS to the peak of the R wave in AVL is going to be greater than 45 um, milliseconds. Uh, and that's how you're going to tell there's a, you know, widened kind of QRS complex there. So just quick review of the left posterior fascicular block. Uh, so this is the other fascicular block you can get, and this is relatively rare compared to, um, you know, the uh, left anterior fascicular block secondary to its um, dual blood supply. Um, and what this is going to do is this, uh, you know, this fascicle activates inferior and posterior walls of the left ventricle. 
Um, so if you, when you have depolarization, the wave is going to spread from the anterolateral region down to the inferolateral direction. So this is going to be opposite of your left anterior fascicular block. So on your EKG and your lateral limb lead, so your 1 in AVL, you're going to show an initial upward deflection followed by a very large downward deflection. Whereas in your inferior leads, so 2, 3 in AVF, you're going to have a small uh, or absent downward deflection followed by a large upward deflection. So unlike in your anterior fascicular block, um, you'll have uh, in your left posterior fascicular block, this will mim mimic a right QRS axis deviation, whereas your left anterior mimicked a left QRS axis deviation. So here's, uh, you know, just the criteria for left posterior fascicular block. Uh, I'm not going to have you memorize these, but if we just take a look at it, it kind of gives us a better representation. Um, so as you can see here, once again, opposite from our left anterior, you're going to have uh, basically a large, um, you know, R wave in leads 2, 3, and AVF, as well as a um, deeper, you know, S wave in leads 1 and AVL. Um, and this is going to represent, you know, kind of mimic your, uh, you know, right axis deviation here. And here's another representation here. And once again, you're going to have a prolonged R wave peak time uh, greater than 45 milliseconds. So this concludes our review on bundle branch blocks. I hope you guys learned something. And until next time, uh, keep making sure you uh, look at as many EKGs as you can and keep practicing.